All right, folks, uh, thanks for joining us on Carpool Chats. Today we're going to talk uh, a little bit more about renewable diesel and what's going on in California. So as most of you are aware, since the inception and implementation of LCFS in, in uh, California in 2010, we've seen an enormous draw of, of renewable fuels, low carbon fuels into the state of California. And uh, obviously that's also opening up under, under Oregon's uh, clean fuels policies uh, as well. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about renewable diesel, what's going on in the California market, and specifically the, announce, the recent announcement from P66 on the conversion of, of the Rodeo refinery. Um, like a little bit of background on renewable diesel. I, I, it's, it's been around for, for a few years now, and I think we all understand uh, some of the, the implications impl implications on fuel quality standpoint. Uh, so our renewable diesel is very similar feedstocks to biodiesel. It's really the differences in the process the, in production. And our biodiesel goes through transesterification, whereas renewable diesel is taking those feedstocks, whether they're virgin oils or used cooking oil, or waste vegetable oil, uh, and hydro treating uh, hydro treating those those feedstocks to produce the renewable diesels and some of the benefits that we've seen coming out of renewable diesel from a fuel quality standpoint uh, it's got it's got improvers on cetane uh, fuel stability cold flow improvers so it's it's turned out to be a, a, a very good product you know it meets ASTM standards uh, carb diesel standards in this case so D975, and it really is a drop-in fuel. So we can, we can, we can blend it uh, with, in, in this case, again, carb diesel or, or diesel fuel. Uh, we can blend it with biodiesel, which is, which is very common in California right now. And, and, and because of, because of, of it, its makeup, it, it, it kind of gets under the radar of some of the advanced diesel fuel uh, ADF rules in California, which are really set to mitigate NOx emissions, and uh, and it it does a wonderful job of that. So, whereas NOx is a little bit of a hindrance on biodiesel, uh, it it requires an additive uh, and and such. Renewable diesel doesn't have that that issue. So, uh, we're seeing huge influxes, big announcements on on more production of renewable diesel. Uh, we're, we're hearing a lot, of, a lot of the same questions come up and we're gonna, we're gonna talk to Nick Weinberg-Lynn um, about that today. And Nick is the, the Renewable Energy Project Manager at Rodeo Refinery. Nick, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, could you give us a minute and do a, do a little self-introduction for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, th thanks for having me, Jeff. And uh, great introduction related to the renewable diesel uh, summary. That's uh, fantastic details and, and really captured the, uh, the excitement of our project here at Phillips 66. Uh, so as you mentioned, Nick weinberg um, I am the manager of renewable energy projects. Uh, so for, for us here at the Rodeo Refinery, uh, that, that's not just this Rodeo Renewed project. Uh, we're bringing a solar project to the Bay Area uh, and a couple other hydrogen projects uh, around our steam methane reformer uh, here as well. So um, I'm a chemical engineer by degree and uh, have grown up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I went to college at, uh, at UCLA and uh, found me myself back in the Bay Area uh, when I started to raise a family. So um, being able to, to do this project and, and to, uh, to kind of bring it from conception all the way to fruition here in 2024, uh, is, is really exciting for me as a as a Bay Area resident and, and, a, and a father of three little kids. So excited to clean up the uh, the Bay Area and provide a, a product that there really is a lot of demand for on the marketplace, as you mentioned. That's fantastic. So you're 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 living and breathing literally uh, this project. So that's that's fantastic. So retooling an entire refinery from from crude to renewable diesel sounds like an enormous undertaking. Can you shed a little bit of light on that, on, on, on what that encompasses or what, what level of detail goes into that? No, absolutely. It's uh, an enormous undertaking might be an understatement. Um, 
you know, we start with the pots and pans that we kind of have at this Rodeo refinery. We are very hydro processing centric. So we have a lot of hydro processing assets, hydro treaters and hydro crackers, and then the associated hydrogen production to be able to do it. And that's what's really so important for the production of renewable diesel. But taking a facility that uh, for the last 124 years has run crude oil and turning it into uh, processing all these renewable feedstocks and, uh, you know, tallows and bean oils, used cooking oils, uh, you know, it's going to take a lot of work. We've got a great design. Uh, we've had a, a team of engineers working on this project uh, for the last nine months and they'll continue going forward. Uh, and, you know, we've moved kind of to the con from the conceptual phase of is this even possible? And the answer is yes. Uh, and we've moved to the optimization phase, right? How's the best way we can retool the refinery? How do we use our marine terminal? How do we use our butane loading rack to bring in uh, feedstocks by rail? Um, and then we, we have a lot of tanks uh, here at the refinery being a crude oil facility for the last several years. So we're able to optimize that uh, to be able to, to utilize the assets we have on the ground. So our real competitive advantage with this project uh, one relates to uh, the assets that we already have and being able to retool them and reuse them. So there's very little uh, green field construction that we need to make this happen. Um, and then number two relates to the number of different ways we can get feedstocks into the facility and then the renewable diesel product to market. And, and so to me, what I'm hearing is that to do a ground up build for a renewable diesel facility is very expensive. You're, you're starting out with a lot of the assets. You've got the hydro treaters set up. Um, so you have those physical assets already, which, which sounds fantastic and, and really kind of lends itself to, to this development. Um, one, of the, one of the main questions, of course, that you get inundated with, and we all, we all get asked a lot, and you kind of touched on this already, is, is, okay, California, the fifth largest economy in the world, huge fuel demand. Uh, we've got the LCFS program. Um, and, and of course, over here, we've got, we've got govern, governor's you know, discussion on electrification and everything else, but we've got, we've got this huge diesel demand. Um, where, or how, how comfortable are you, or, or can you put in context the level of feedstocks um, that it's gonna take for you to keep up with this demand or or what part of the market, um, you know, how much of this market do you think you'll be supplying? Yeah, so let's take two parts. Uh, on the feedstock side, um, we want to, you know, we've got commercial offices in, in Singapore, in London, and in Houston. So our goal with the feedstocks is be able to work our way up the, the value chain to be able to acquire uh, the different feedstocks to make, make renewable diesel. Uh, you know, when we look at a process design for, for the new refinery, we kind of have to pick percentages of different feedstocks, whether it's tallow or fog, uh, bean oils. Uh, the one thing I can probably guarantee is what will actually be running won't be the design percentages, um, right? We want to be able to adapt to the market and, and see what's out there. Uh, and the other big part, about half of our capital investment for this project is in pretreatment. So the, the one thing we are going to be constructing from scratch is new pretreatment facilities. Uh, and that'll really enable us to bring in different type of feedstocks out there. So we, we are confident that there's a, a healthy amount of renewable feedstocks, provided you can bring them in from different sources, whether that's domestic, whether that's local, right? We're looking at local truck offloading, uh, or whether that's global. And we've got a marine terminal to be able to do that. So from a feedstock standpoint, we, we are very well situated to be able to move up the value chain um, and to be able to acquire those different feedstocks. Uh, yeah, and the, the other one on, on the product side in terms of where we are, right, California's diesel demand sits at about a quarter million barrels per day uh, is kind of where we're sitting now. About 20 to 25 percent of that is a bio-renewable today. So th there is still a, a demand out there for renewable fuels, um, especially, you know, I'll, I'll give the other plug on the renewable diesel that you mentioned earlier, but it being a drop in replacement for carb diesel uh, versus a biodiesel is important. Um, one, for the state of California to be able to meet its climate change goals, um, but number two, to be able to supply uh, customers and, and still be able to, uh, to make it within the warranties of, of engines versus biodiesel. Very important. Very important. We, we, we work with the OEMs quite a bit at the Fuels Institute. 
on on warranty discussions. Uh, and and it, that kind of brings up my next question, and it, it has to do with fuel quality. I, I've gotten very little anecdotal bad um, information on the fuel quality of renewable diesel. As I said, you know, the it's it's in, in a lot of senses it's superior to our ULSD. Uh, however, I, I, I've I've gotten some messaging from from downstream folks where paraffin content is too high, so the wax content uh, is is has been out of out of whack, and again, very rarely. But but this this is a fuel quality issue that um, I I think we're all a number of folks are working on right now, and it, and it has to do with the level of isomerization of of the feedstock, and you mentioned the pre-treatment process and and the hydro treating process. What is what is P sixty six or this refinery designed uh, designed to do to to help with that potential issue? And right. it, and what is I'm sorry. And, and what is some of what what's going on in the process of creating the renewable diesel? Um, how do you know when you isomerized the product enough? Yes, is the question. No, it, it's a great question. And look, we talk about renewable diesel and all the benefits. If it's not going to work in your engine, it's not going to work as a fuel. And that's really the starting point uh, for our discussion. What, you know, I mentioned the, re the conversion of the refinery. Um, we are using large fixed bed reactors to be able to do this. And, and that's really one of our, our biggest uh, advantages when making this feedstock is we have a tremendous amount of catalyst volume. Now, what kind of catalyst are we actually using in there, right? And um, at, at a high level, the catalyst is really hydrodeoxygenation, so removing of the oxygen elements um, that comes in with the renewable feedstocks, um, and a little bit of cleanup catalyst. And then a large part of it is this dewaxing catalyst. Uh, and the dewaxing catalyst is the important part to be able to produce a fuel, a renewable diesel on the back end, that meets all of the California fuel specs and works in all the engines. Um, additionally, that cetane that we mentioned, right, we're, we're kind of be probably around 80 cetane, uh, where typically the carb specs are in the low 50s. So big boost on cetane as well. But the vast majority is our large volume of catalyst, uh, and that gives enough reactor volume time to be able to fully make the conversion from the triglycerides and highly paraffinic feeds into a diesel fuel that can work in, work in all engines out there. That's and just just to add add to that. Do you do you see any need for for uh, new standardization, new ASTM standardization on renewable diesel in the next couple of years? Um, you know, because of this additional fuel that, that we're not typically seeing in biodiesel or, or diesel fuel. Um, do, do you, I know P sixty six has an incredible amount of internal testing on fuel quality. Should the downstream industry be getting ready for additional testing requirements that, that could help them on fuel quality issues? Yeah, it's, it's a fair question. I think everything we've seen internally, both in our R&D group, in pilot plant studies, and working with our fuels quality group, is the fuels that we'll be making off these process units uh, meet or exceed all the specs out there, uh, including ones you know that may not be directly listed uh, as diesel specs. So we're, we're testing everything that we can in our pilot plants um, and then working with our catalyst vendor, really. The performance of the catalyst is the most important part for making a diesel fuel that works. So as an industry, if you're gonna use large fixed bed catalyzed reactions, uh, you're probably coming off a good spot for it. Um, depending on how other folks are actually producing this, uh, that there may be a need for it. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's, that's pretty consistent from what I've heard again from a quality standpoint overall. Um, let, let's talk about the marketing of the fuel. It sounds like Rodeo production is going to begin as early as the first or second quarter of 2021 uh, with some major upticks in production in 2022 and 2024. Uh, once once you have the renewable diesel to sell, where will it go first, and and what what's the marketing plan? I, I get asked this question a lot. You know, where can I find it? Who should I call? Um, and and it's it, it's a relatively new product, and and people are 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 still on a learning curve with it. Um, 
the more they learn about it, you know, the carbon intensity of the fuel and what it does for California to help them meet their standards and their goals, uh, it, it's all been very positive. So what, um, what's your outlook on, on the marketing aspect of this product? Yeah, great, great question again. You know, like change is tough for everybody, right? It takes some adjustment. Uh, who knew we'd all be Zoom experts by the, by the time this thing wrapped up? Uh, but, you know, along the same lines with bringing a new product to market is there's a lot of questions out there. Our plan is to, to work our way through our branded channels, right? We have the 76 brand out here in California, uh, be ready to receive this project product, um, provide the specs, get it to market, uh, really build those relationships as we go forward. So our, our main play is to get to the branded channels and then we'll work through the unbranded networks with other customers after that. Uh, and then, of course, in, in Northern California, we've got a proprietary terminal that we'll market it through in, in Richmond and Southern California uh, through LIT. So kind of those are our, our major channels for, for marketing the product. Uh, but, you know, as, as you mentioned, a lot of it is just kind of an education um, for downstream folks and really for consumers. Um, you know, we brought this product, the full project when we announced it uh, to the to the Bay Area and Rodeo here and. Um, it brings cleaner air and, and keeps jobs and keeps the refinery alive and competitive for, for the next several years. But one of the first questions I have to answer is, what is renewable diesel? Um, sounds all well and good, right? Is it, is it too good to be true? What's the downsides? And, and so it's just a lot of education uh, for our employees too, right? This is a new, uh, new product that they'll be producing. Uh, but when you go through it as you have, what the, what the positives are out there, uh, from a carbon intensity standpoint, through the actual fuel qualities, um, you know, people are really excited about it. Yeah, and it is, as far as I can see, you know, we're only going to see upticks in it as long as we can keep up on feedstocks. And, you know, we're looking at, at Canada's adoption of, of similar programming and policies. And, um, you know, we've got, we've got other regional groups in the country that are working on LCFS like policies, um, and and then who knows what a new administration might bring. I right. mean, we've all we've all kind of got a, a little view of that. Um, well, Nick, really appreciate your time today. Thank you for for this insight, and uh, we look forward to to watching you guys gear up. And uh, we've got we've got plenty of friends out in California that I'm sure are going to have more questions for you in the future. Fantastic. Well, thanks for having me. I look forward to answering them and uh, bringing this product to market. All right. Thanks a lot, Nick. Take care.